introducing a spectacular duo for a SLIS public talk entitled School Library Grievance, Teacher Autonomy versus Administrative Collection Policies. It is our pleasure and privilege to have with us Gail Chaddock Costello, who is currently the president of the Langley Teachers Association in British Columbia, and her stalwart colleague, Richard Beaudry, who is currently the vice president of the same association. Um, they are here to share non-confidential um, information about a case going on in Langley, BC around leveling and censorship of a school library collection. I am not going to introduce the case in any terms beyond that because in such cases it's very important that absolutely correct and factual information is presented in the strictest of terms. So, uh, for example, even a phrasing like leveling of a collection may be something you want to um, operationalized for the audience. Um, we have um, booked the recording up until one o'clock. My understanding is Gail and Richard will provide about 15 minutes from 12.45 to one for Q&A. Um, thank you to colleagues and students for being here. I do wanna underscore that this is being recorded for the broader community, both in Alberta and BC. And so, although we have a small audience here today, many people have indicated to me directly that they plan on accessing the recording and we really appreciate your participating in recording because ultimately it probably will be viewed nationally m many times. And a special thanks to colleagues and students who did come physically yes. to be here. Um, I am taking Richard and Gail to lunch at Earl's across the road and anybody that wants to join us that is here now, um, you're more than welcome to come and participate in that if you so choose. Um, they have mics that are on, they don't sound on, but they're on for the recording and when we come to the Q&A, I will grab one of the mics and anyone asking a question will have to use the mic and they will share a mic. And just so you know, the Q&A will be recorded. And um, just to remind you that they are discussing um, non-confidential matters only, so it, it, it is possible that you pose a question in which they cannot fully answer depending on the nature mm -hmm. of the question. And anybody asking a question will be recorded. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to you and once again, really appreciate your time. It's, it's you're busy people and, and we thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, we're very happy to be here, and I won't spend much time introducing myself. I'm Gail Chada Costello. I'm president of the Langley Teachers Association, and I also sit on the Provincial British Columbia Teachers Federation Executive Committee. Richard Beaudry is the vice president of the union is in Langley, and he sits on a variety of other committees as well for the BCTF. I just want to say at the outset that the BC Teachers Federation has been very supportive of all our work in filing grievances and working on behalf of sustaining and maintaining public school libraries and at the same time our local, the Lenny Teachers Association, has uh, contributed and is interested and supportive as well of our being here today. So I want to uh, bring together the fact that the unions and the libraries and the staff are all working together in this regard. I'm going to back up a little bit and just go through a few things very, very quickly. Our work together, Richard and I, uh, started in 2006. And at that time, Richard was a librarian, and I had just um, become very involved in the union. So Richard, do you want to start off with this one? OK, well, um, this actually happened the year before, the 2006 uh, happened the year before I started working in town. But what had happened is uh, the group of parents at one of our middle schools <clears throat> met with their principal, and they signed a caveat mm -hmm. as to the use of the library in the school. And what it did is it gave parents permission to enter the school and remove books that they saw fit to be removed. Um, <clears throat> and to give some examples of uh, what they had, um, if I can take a look here, um, it included books that were art books, photography books, encyclopedias. Uh, one parent wanted to have the ends removed out of the encyclopedias because it contained the words nudes and it had nude paintings in it. So can you imagine encyclopedias with all the ends removed in a school library in a high school? That sounds very strange. And they also had books uh, that uh, they concerned them uh, that were considered amoral. And those books were, um, oops, I didn't have that. OK. So there were books like um, uh, The Shopaholic mm -hmm. and um, The uh, Sisterhood of the Traveling, Traveling Pants, Pants was considered yes. amoral by this group of parents. Oh. Now, at the time, they didn't do anything specific. It was a document that was signed and nobody did anything. But in 2009, yes. in 2009, when Gail and I were together, yeah. 
They decided that they were going to try to enforce it at that time, and then, of course, the complaints rightfully came from staff at the school, and it was led by the teacher librarian, who had grave concerns over the fact that this particular document was going to be enforced, and, of course, it raised issues in regard to her proprietary right to choose the documents for the library, and the other parents in the school at the time were not necessarily enamored of this particular document, and it, of course, did not follow board policy. So for a variety of reasons, the union had to become involved. And at that time, I filed a motion before our teachers association. It was passed. We then went forward to file a grievance, which we won. And just to speed things along, so we won this grievance, which was the beginning of our work together, Richard and I, on ensuring that teacher librarians and teacher libraries in the system were supported by the full weight of the union, as well as all of the local, provincial, and national library associations. So, so the details. Well, uh, ever so briefly, basically, Gail, as you saw in the previous slide that I put in, put a motion out to the LTA. And what the LTA did with her assistance mm -hmm. was to send a letter to the district saying they had serious concerns about what was happening. And that was important. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they had asked, Gail said that, because I had, uh, they had talked to me because I had just arrived there and I had just finished uh, my MLIS a few years before that that we should do something about oh, it. So I met with way. the principal and, and, and the school librarian, and this is the first time where the focus in a school was simply, well, it's just our library. Who's going to care? To which my response was, if you attack one library in Canada, you attack them all. So you need to understand that we are going to notify the Library Associations of Canada, the BCLA, I mean, everybody. Everybody's going to be notified. This is a concern to the whole library community, and we will report this. And so that's the first time that the school district understood that between what the union was doing, which is basically going through the contract to make sure that the teacher librarian had the right to do her job, and parents cannot simply come in and decide with the principal on a document that has no relevance, not a policy of the district, to be able to to do whatever they wanted in a school library. We need to move on. Yep. That was great. So that was our first um, foray into tr to protecting school libraries. And as you can see, we were very successful. I think it was more than a little shock, as Richard has indicated, to the board. And, uh, and it was a pleasant surprise for teachers within the district to see that the marriage of intellectual freedom and the needs of libraries could be protected within the groundwork of our collective agreement and the union, that the union was prepared to do the work and that we could actually handle this, be successful without needing to in go through court intervention. So because of our time, let's zip through the next one, Richard. And this one actually quite involves Richard. Uh, in, two, in May of 2011, Richard, Richard was um, elected as vice president of the Langley Teachers Association, which meant that he had to resign from his position. He was currently library at a high school. When he did that, he was then given some information. All right. So, um, and one of the reasons why I decided, by the way, I should tell you, is that we had a good working relationship because of what we had done previously to this. Mm -hmm. And so when Gail asked me to join her and the union executive, mm -hmm. I accepted because we have a good working relationship, which we still do to this day, four years later. Mm -hmm. But in particular to this case, once I was told that I had been elected, I notified the district that I was going to be a full-time table officer, which the, first, the president and vice president in Langley are in the union office. So. The first thing they told me is, oh, okay, um, we're not replacing you. We're closing the library, so please close your office, put everything away. There won't be a library. And I was pretty shocked because this is a high school library. Mm -hmm. There are eight high schools in town, and yet they're telling us that the library is going to be shut down, mm -hmm. which at the end of the year, that's exactly what they did. They yeah. closed the library. Now, September rolls around, mm -hmm. parents, are ballistic. They can't yes. believe that we're the only high school in town where the library is closed. So <clears throat> they have several meetings, the PAC group, the Parents Action Committee, and um, with the district and with the uh, principal and say, this is unacceptable, I absolutely unacceptable. So then in October, they reopen the library and they bring in a part-time, at that point, uh, library tech. And then the library tech's position as the year progressed went from, I think, two days a week to three days a week to five days a week. We have to speed it up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So at this point in time when we realized and we were hearing from the teachers in the school that they were frustrated, this actually came out of parental concern, teacher frustration, that they would be going to the person who was appointed to the role as a library tech who was doing the very best work they could do and trying to accommodate teachers, but in the process of trying to accommodate teachers' requests who were used to having a fully qualified teacher librarian capable of doing research and doing the work on the projects they wanted, of course this individual wasn't trained in that work, couldn't do that work, and it was really outside the spectrum of their union position. So we realized then clearly based on the demands that were being placed on this person that they were being asked to do the work of a teacher librarian, that the work of a teacher librarian was important and integral to the school and that we should be fighting one to divide the lines between what really qualified as teacher tech work, as library technician work and teach librarian work, and at the same time follow up with the support from the parents to get this position reinstated. So that was the work we undertook at that time by filing a grievance. And we also, when you're a union, you have to find an issue or an article within your collective agreement that, su uh, that supports the position you have. Our position was that this was contracting out that the library tech had been hired to replace a full-time teacher librarian and was in fact now being asked to do the work of a teacher librarian, which really, no fault to them, they weren't capable of doing, nor should they have been asked to do. So therefore we filed the grievance and we took it through the process of contracting out. There was very little uptake on behalf of the board and we went through what's called in union jargon step one, step two, step three of the grievance process and we were still not successful. They said, nope, this is not contracting out. We have the right to replace that worker with any worker we like and you don't win the grievance. So I filed what's called filing for arbitration. The BC Teachers Federation agreed with me. They said, yes, we will take this to arbitration. We think this is winnable. We think it's a great case, good cause, and we're going there with you. So then they appointed outside legal counsel. Richard and I met with outside legal counsel. Outside legal counsel was frankly thrilled to be taking this on because they had such a great candidate in Richard with his credentials and the lines were so clear in their opinion that we just couldn't lose. And so we met, we spoke with them, and um, then we had a fabulous result afterwards. I'll let Richard fill in the library details, but the union part of it is that what happened afterwards was once they knew from the board level that we were taking this all the way to court and to arbitration, they asked for what's called a step four meeting and it was resolved. So I'll pass it over to Richard um, for details. To be, to be brief, once they had hired the, teacher, the, teach, the uh, library tech, there, I had, you know, I would have preferred that the only high school in town have a teacher librarian like all the other eight uh, teacher uh, school libraries. But they did hire this person. At least there was somebody in the library who was open, so I was happy with that. But the expectation from the teachers, and, and my background is I am an MLIS graduate. I also have a second master's in information technology. So I did a lot of work, and we're starting to work with distributed learning. We're trying to work with teachers to do all kinds of work online. So I was doing all kinds of projects with the teachers. I also was working with the local university, Kwantlen University, and we were introducing transition literacy, getting kids who are graduating onto university to understand the program. I had worked with uh, uh, the University of BC on multiple literacies and the introduction of that to students and working with all of this work, which was great. All the teachers liked it. Problem mm -hmm. was, I wasn't there. They expected that the library tech who was there would do all my work. Now at first when they came to see me, mm -hmm. I, she kept phoning me up and she's saying, well, they want me to do this work. And I said, well, it's, it's not your work. You should tell them that. But they insisted that and she kept phoning me and I kept telling to Gail, um, she shouldn't be doing this work. And so that's when we decided we had to do something because they were trying to get a person who was a library tech to do the work of a teacher librarian. Mm -hmm. So we were successful. Richard's, uh, Richard being Richard, who always wants to help, had actually been, against my advice, going over and actually assisting the, the library tech. And uh, not, that's not said to get Richard in trouble. He <laughs> just wanted the school library to be doing all the great things school libraries should do. But the difficulty, of course, was that it, 
it was the role of a teacher librarian to be there. So we took this forward, as I say, to arbitration. There's something about going to arbitration that has a bit of a chilling effect on, on school districts, and so they don't like to, to lose. And uh, not I don't either, quite frankly, <laughs> not that it's a union, but uh, they don't like to go into a situation where there's a great potential they will lose and then have to, in effect, give you what you've asked for. Anyway, it's much better if we can settle it out of court. So what happened is we were successful. They did rehire. Uh, point uh, 857, uh, which was your positional point before you uh, were removed from the library. They also agreed, which is something we're in the middle of now, to this district-wide review of teacher librarian services. They did acknowledge there's a clear distinction between library techs and teacher librarians, and the lines need to be clearly drawn, and that the work has to be uh, differentiated. And uh, this library grievance was actually kind of ground setting for us and for the BCTF because it was the first one, one in the province that was with prejudice. When the district had approached me and wanted to uh, step back from arbitration, I had said that yes, the union was prepared to step back from arbitration as long as the win was with prejudice. And we were able to get that, and that means that it's not protected, it's not specific only to that particular case in time and place. We can take it forward and use it as a, as a case in other grievance wins and in other arbitrations. So with prejudice was a very important win in addition to all of the other reinstatements that came on the contracting out grievance. And the other thing I think that's important out of all of this is that it clearly defined the roles of a library tech and a teacher librarian in Langley and provincially because, as she said, this was accepted as a provincial matter. Okay. This will move us on to the last of the three grievances so far, and I should tell you there's a fourth one pending, if not a fifth. Yeah. So uh, there's one thing about success breeding success. So we have a fourth one that we are preparing right now in Langley, uh, so we could be back again. But <laughs> right now, this year, we were contacted by a school, and uh, they asked Richard to drop by. They had some questions. The teacher librarian or person who had held the position had known Richard. So Richard went by to have what he thought was a simple little conversation. Turned out that there was much more behind the scenes than, uh, than was evident on the top. And so we then went back to have a second meeting. What happened at the meetings we held there was that the staff confirmed that the library was closed, that books were being removed, and Richard w went in and took pictures, which actually gave us a lot of information and data that we were then able to use as part of the grievance process. So I'll let you speak about this and I'll flip yeah. through. Uh, one of the interesting things in working in a union is that sometimes when you go to a meeting and you verbally say that something's happening, you, they can say, well, it's not really like that. So one of the things that both Gail and I have mm -hmm. learned over the years is that you take mm -hmm. pictures. You take pictures and you can demonstrate exactly what's happening. So when I came by, I, I saw the library, I walked in there, I took pictures. But you see here all these empty areas, this is the fiction collection. The used to be. Used to be the used fiction be. collection. Literally, in, and in the end, we found out after an inventory was done, 5,000 books were removed from here because the decision had been made in this school that they were going to level everything. Everything. The book room, the private collections of books accumulated over the years by teachers. So this is basically... What happened is there was a teacher librarian. The teacher librarian resisted having this done. Her job evaporated at the end of the year. She was replaced by a veteran teacher, a library tech. She didn't want to do this. She was let go at the end of the second year. And so this year we have a brand new library tech who's been basically ordered Be to careful, eliminate, Richard. well, directed to order. Directed, yes. Just ex explain so those people who don't know what you mean by leveling, that like the fat boxes and Pinnell whole thing right. so that they understand. Right. And, not, and not everything in the school was leveled, just to no. be clear. Yeah. They, they leveled the, the library, uh, the book room, and they were, le the, they were leveling the uh, collections in the, um, reading in the reading room and the, uh, the collections in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Leveling means. Okay. Leveling by Fontas and Pinnell, and there's nothing wrong with leveling. They have leveled collections all the way through the district. That's not a problem. And the Fontas and Pinnell... Is, is, is a way that teachers can get books to kids based on their reading level. The difficulty is in this particular case is that the, the presumption was is that the reading books in the school shouldn't be distributed to kids. They should only have books that are leveled. Only books that are leveled. So there was a, a, a loss here of, mm -hmm. of the ability for the kids to be able to choose books on their own. 
because anything that wasn't specific to be leveled or was considered old or was considered to be too infantile or of, of less interest in the specific books that Fontes and Pinnell, and there's this book leveling website where they can tell you what the books are and why they should read these, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to take everything out in the fiction collection and basically replace it with leveled books. That's right. And so the difficulty, of course, for the staff in the school was that they felt that their professional autonomy, which is a clause within our collective agreement, was being challenged. So that if I'm teaching grade three and I have a collection of books, so I'm teaching kindergarten and I have a collection of books, whatever grade, I have the books that are, quote, part of my curriculum. But then I have interest books, reading books, library books, free choice books, picture books, all the collections of books that every teacher gathers throughout the years, and children self Choose. They go and decide that today they're interested in art and tomorrow they're interested in horses and as the story goes. What was happening was that there was the, um, the protocol in the school that was being applied was that books all had to be leveled and accessible based on their reading ability and based on the curriculum. So if there wasn't a linear line to be drawn between the curriculum in grade two and a particular book, then it shouldn't be in the school. And so therefore, there were very tight lines being put around what books were appropriate for reading, by what age level, by what grade level, and, uh, and that led to the culling and the leveling of the materials. So what our job was as a union, and uh, very fortunate to have Richard's library expertise, of course, in the situation, was to go in and meet with all of the staff. CUPE invited themselves. They're not our union. We don't represent them, but they asked to attend, and then to outline the concerns to file a grievance, and I'd say that grievance probably um, every potential possible thing that I could find uh, was part of that grievance because we wanted to win and we made sure we grieved under every possible scenario, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, under our own uh, collective agreement, under the rights of international rights of the child, everything we could find that spoke about freedom of expression, right to choose, and freedom within the community, intellectual freedom, we used everything we could find. And that grievance allowed us to speak to all those things. Of course, we had to spend quite a bit of time defending why we thought all those things were relevant. But fortunately, I had Richard, who did all the great research, and gave me all the answers. And so we tag-teamed in the grievance meetings. Yeah, I, I think the, the other thing that causes a bit of a, a delay in the, in the way we ended up fixing this, uh, this grievance is the fact that we considered it to be a question of censorship. And the employer group, which is BCPC, uh, got stuck on that particular word. They said there was no legal definition of censorship. Mm -hmm. And so that was a problem because every time we were saying, well, they're removing books, they're removing a lot of books, we have pictures of them removing books. Books are not in the library any longer. They are out of the library. So we consider this censorship. And they kept saying, well, there's no legal definition of what censorship is. So we kind of turned around that for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And Gail's response to that in the end was? Well, it really doesn't matter if there's one final definition of censorship. We can point to numerous cases that have been won at the provincial Supreme Court, at the Supreme Court of Canada level, the Chamberlain case in 2002. And it in each of those situations, some definition of what constituted censorship, i.e., one individual or a small group of individuals based on their own personal beliefs, removing books from a library, call it what you will. You can name it censorship, you can call it culling of uh, library collections, you can call it imposed rule by any group of people who don't have the permission, either by policy or by the public's consent, to remove those books. Naming it is not what's important, it's the action that was undertaken that was important, and so we can't be spinning our wheels on that. We need to be going forward and fixing the problem, which is we need to put the books back, we need policies in place, we need to teach librarians in place, and we need to fix the problem that was created. The, other, the second point was basically this, the school policy 5062, mm -hmm. which had been approved in 2001. In the first um, grievance that we were talking about today with the parents coming in, mm -hmm. this is what we used basically to defend the point that you can't simply walk into a library and remove materials. Mm -hmm. The problem with this is that the board said, well, this is not a policy any longer mm -hmm. of the district. It's an administrative policy to be followed by, by, by administrators. So it's not a district policy anymore. So you know, we're kind of at a loss here to figure out, wow, you don't have any policy in place for people to come into a library and remove books. Mm -hmm. That's a major concern. So one of the points that we won mm -hmm. 
at the end of this grievance is that all of these policies will be in place by June this year. These are policies that we tried very hard to get into place before I went into the office as a table officer and that we are continuing to work with now and that they've assured us at the end of this grievance that we will have in place by the end. So there will be a policy similar to what was here out there hopefully by the end of June. And we have been meeting with them. I've been meeting with Gail with the Teacher Librarians Association and we've been meeting with the district and we're working on language right now. That's right. So we, we had a number of wins. This grievance was one and there were some very important items that we asked for in the restoration of the library and before we settled a grievance, when a grievance is settled, and maybe you want to scroll through to some of those, Richard. When we settle a grievance, we have to determine, when we write a grievance actually, we have to give the employer a list of what we see as a resolution. And so in the resolution, you'd like me to move which way? Uh -huh. There we I go. Let's see what's behind it. All right. So in the resolution of the grievance, actually, we were 100% successful, actually even a little bit more, 110%, because we kind of had some other additional things at it. We, of course, wanted the teacher librarian position restored. She had been originally the teacher librarian at a point two. We felt that because of the additional work that was going to be required, it had to be at a point four for this year. So that was agreed to until the end of this year, a point four, and then maintaining the point two go forward. It's a very, it's a small school. Uh, we also wanted to ensure that there would be funds available if we have 5,000 plus books that have been removed. Some were found and some were returned, but uh, we wanted to ensure the collection was at least as good as, if not better, than before. So the district did commit money so that once the analysis of what has been removed and what needs to be replaced is done, the funds will be there to restore the library. We wanted to ensure that uh, personal belongings that had been removed from classrooms were restored and individual teachers had the right to itemize those uh, lists, those itemize those materials and be financially reimbursed and that was agreed to. We knew it would take time for teachers to meet with a teacher librarian and to review what had happened in the library and how they wanted to resolve it. Uh, we asked that Richard Beaudry meet with those groups and so Richard's been appointed to the two committees. He'll meet with the K-3 to teachers and the four to five teachers and talk primary and intermediate and talk about what uh, they feel they need and the district was um, willing to provide release time for those teachers to do that work so that was another win for us it wasn't on the side of their table on their own time and in addition to that win um, with the with that support we also wanted to ensure that um, there was something else we got. I'm losing my track. Where did I put them all? We met here and we got this. We also, oh, I know, we wanted the policies, as Richard has already spoken to, uh, in place. Now, librarians in the district and the local library association has been working on this for a number of years, but they've never been adopted. And so this was the perfect time to bring it forward, given this example of what can happen when there aren't policies and regulations and procedures in place. And so we asked that policies around selection and removal of books be brought up to date, they've been worked on for years, but if any tweaking had to be done, that that would be done this year. And they agreed to present those uh, new administrative policies to the board for a vote before the end of June of this year. They also agreed to start up the committee, which had not started yet as a result of the previous grievance win, so that began in January. And we did get a formal letter in writing from the superintendent of schools confirming that this work would take place and that the administrative policies would be written. I think that's it. <laughs> And, and it, it, it's important for us to understand that, you know, teachers literally in Langley, the teacher librarians had their own, we kind of worked on our own policies, but these were not policies that were in any way necessarily to be followed by the administration because they weren't policies that were district level or even uh, policies that were administrative. So, and we've been trying for years to get it. I mean, one of the things we really wanted because of the first grievance with the parents coming in and, and taking books out on their own is to have a reconsideration form. We wanted people to come in and say, okay, I don't like this book, so you need to explain why. There has to be a policy in place. There has to be collaboration between people to determine whether this book should be removed or not. Tried and tried and tried to get that in. Now, that will be in in June. The second one is also selection committee. Uh, that's not selection committee, sorry, selection policy, basically, where we have, a, a, you know, the librarians will have, basically, when it comes to choosing books for the library, a set number of goals that they need and the type of books that should be used in a K-3 to or K-5 to school, which we have now, middle schools and high schools. Uh, the other thing is um, we need also weeding collection. Uh, 
for, uh, policy because, again, for the weeding, we can't have somebody simply remove 5,000 books from a collection because they think it's a good idea. So we have to have all these in place that if anything's weeded, it has to follow a process. These are all things that most school districts have. This is something that our district should have too, and we will have it in place by the end of June, and that's very, very important. That's great. The other part, and I'll speak to it just briefly here, is why did it work? And I think that this part is really important for us. Uh, when you look at what's going on in terms of reductions of teachers and specialist teachers all around the province in British Columbia, I'm speaking, that for some of you are unaware, it goes back to 2001 2 and a stripping of collective agreements by the, the current Liberal government. That's something that's now in the uh, appeal court before the province of British Columbia. So there's a lot of backstory to why specialist teachers, whether whether they be special education teachers, or whether they are t behavior teachers, or whether they are uh, ELL teachers, or they teach librarians. Any list of specialists that's not a stand and deliver classroom teachers, they've all been, in many ways, reduced, had their assignments added to, or their positions removed. But the group that was hit hardest, by far, were the teach librarians. Teach librarians were decimated by the legislation that was passed by the Liberal government in 2001, which is why the BCTF has fought vigilantly, consistently for the past 14 years to have that legislation overthrown. We have, in fact, won every time we've gone to court. One would think that would resolve things, but not the case. We still have another court case we're waiting to hear from in the spring, and we, we hope that we'll resolve it. If not, we will be before the Supreme Court of Canada. But it is that marriage of the union's desire to do public good and to see public good out there in the community to fight for the rights of everybody who is a worker, who is employed, who has a job description, who has a task to do, to have the right to do that job and to do it within the parameters that, has been, that have been defined as their job and to be able to come forward and say, my job has been diminished, my job has been undermined, my job has been removed, my job has been changed, and I'm not happy. How can we use the collective agreement to promote the work of people in any variety of situations, but in these three scenarios we've just presented to you to, pro uh, to protect and promote the work of teacher librarians. We've been very successful in Langley. The BCTF has been extremely supportive of the work we've done in Langley. And uh, we think that it is that marriage of common ideas at the base of it, where teachers and librarians have, are really civil libertarians all the time. We're out there fighting for civil rights and the right for freedom of speech, and we're protecting that in libraries, and so are unions. So it's a natural fit for us, and it's worked very well. Yeah, I, think the, I think the lesson to be learned here is that the teachers in Langley um, and, and across BC now understand that there is a way that we can work to restore some of the stuff that's happened to libraries. 277 teacher librarians were, uh, positions were lost from 2001 to 2008. And so um, some of them are coming back simply because of the fact that there is a position where we are saying the way this was done is wrong. You have to do it a different way. So we can defend some of these positions. We can defend some of the fact that some books were removed. We can work with um, both with other locals. We can work with uh, districts at restoring some of the positions that were lost simply because of the way they were done. That's where the union's important, right? It's not just the fact that I have a particular interest in, in librarianship or that um, I am a teacher librarian that this has been successful. It's because the union. Uh, has been able to come in and, and represent our interests. And the fact is, is we also relied on the library community to give exactly. us as much support as possible. Mm -hmm. Between that, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're Huge. successful, is because the union was there, mm -hmm. stood up to what was happening, and we also had the library community. Because again, in this particular case, the first thing that we told them is that the union is going to fight this, and the library community is behind us. Mm -hmm. And I think that was important. There was work that had been done, interestingly enough, on the last uh, set of grievances we filed. Previous to our taking this grievance forward, there had been work done by the local library uh, association in Langley. They had written some position papers. The provincial library association had written some position papers, particularly on leveling. Some of that work had been done. There was work that had been done at a national level, and the ability to collect all of that work 
and to put it together so that we had the weight of librarians locally, provincially, nationally, and at the university level and national committees saying this is wrong and this is inappropriate, and that work and that research melding uh, in a very nice form with the union's positions and articles within our collective agreement, articles under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the melding of all of them coming to the same central focus point and saying the same thing meant that we could go forward and we were on very solid ground and those things were a unified approach and together we are better together we are stronger it helps us if you're not there in the wilderness with your lone candle hoping that somebody's not going to snuff you out yeah. so I think that pretty much explains the three <laughs> grievances that we're with and we're coming up to the end of this presentation so if there are any questions, questions. I think there's a process Thank you so much. If there are questions, just raise your hand and I will uh, bring the mic over and just hold the mic while you have the floor, please. And if you would, if it's to either of us, that's Thanks, fine. Tony. But if it's for Richard or myself, if you're clear, then we can trade the mic. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for a good news story. Yay. Very often when we hear about censorship uh, challenges, it's not a good news story. And talking about the policy is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think it's a real uh, call for us as librarians to be involved in our library associations mm -hmm. and to be involved in the unions mm -hmm. that we're involved with. And uh, recently I've been doing some work uh, on a book uh, about school library standards and guidelines and so on. And I was very interested to see that in both Norway and Sweden, the unions of librarians have taken on a very, very strong role mm -hmm. in defining the work of a teacher librarian and supporting that work. So Great. thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, is, can you give us an indication just in general of what the upcoming cases mm -hmm. Are, are about because yeah. you've given us three very different types of grievances mm -hmm. and thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's a grievance that we'll be pursuing uh, in the near future and it has to do with the fact that if you're dealing in a, a larger school and your percentage of time is continually reduced to the point where you feel ineffective and you say you know I can't possibly lift that thousand pound Bowl, uh, ball with this tiny little lever, if I can't do that work and I can't do it well, then perhaps I'll step back and, and go back and do something else. So therefore, when that happened, there were some decisions made about how the library would evolve, what the library would look like without consultation and without member input and without the input of the union. And so therefore, the library in that particular place looks very different now than it did previously. And the grievance there will be about, does administration have the right really to completely reconfigure the look and the feel and the work of a library without consulting its members with inside the building, without consulting, again, this is why these policies and procedures are so important uh, of the district. And in regard to the union contract, where have they breached our collective agreement and how can we act on that to restore the library to quote its former glory. So this will be about a, a reconfiguration of the staffing, the work of the library and the hours of the library within a school setting. Very different quite frankly from any of the other three that we've done previously. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. Um, I wonder about sharing the good news story far and wide, because I certainly have had teacher librarians call me and say, they're going to love, my, the principal's going to level my library, what do I do? Mm -hmm. um, so at least sharing that out to other provinces and to the to the school library associations about it just it, for like it could be in our equivalent of the bookmark that you have which is the bctla um, publication and i also wonder about putting it out to fontas and pinnell and trying to get them to do you know to just suggest that while we all support kids learning how to read and learning how to read, reading at, a, at, a, at their reading level when, and at a guided reading level in, the, in reading levels, that we, that, they, that we also believe in free choice reading. And you know, I don't 
love that my kid reads Captain Underpants, but he reads Captain Underpants and he's a reader. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not, and as a librarian, you know, it wouldn't be my choice, but he chooses <laughs> Captain Underpants and, and that's okay. And I'm sure Fount Fountas and Pinnell don't level Captain Underpants. So is there a way that the next step, and I know Richard, this is really you more than the union, but how can we advocate to the, to the leveling craze about how can't we, can't we find a happy medium between leveling the whole place and leveling for reading instruction, but the reading instruction isn't what school libraries are necessarily all about. Well, I think one of the first steps that they did in, in, in BC was the fact that when all of this started, it's actually started two schools ago. This is the result of three schools, but it, literally what had happened in the first one is that they had a teacher librarian who said, not happening, not under my watch. And then in a second one, uh, the teacher librarian who was there had previously, the year previous to that, one teacher librarian of the year. Again, saying, not happening here. And what, she, what that person did is that they went to the BC Teacher Librarians Association and said, I need some support. And that's what the BCTLA did. They wrote a position paper, literally mm -hmm. explaining that leveling is not a good idea. So, well, not that leveling is not well, a good idea. For a whole collection. It's not the only no. idea. Yeah, they wanted to, what they wanted to do is to explain that, you know, you don't have to level a whole collection. What you can do is you can have some of that. And that's a conversation, literally, that's ongoing now because of the fact that because of this particular situation and other situations that are occurring in BC where people are saying, oh, well, the Fontes and Pinnell and, and all of this is a great idea. So they have taken notice at the BC Teacher Librarians Association because it happened in our particular neck of the woods. The Langley Teacher Librarians Association is also using this document and the Langley Teachers Association is also using this document as, a, as an important paper, as an important document in saying that, yes, there is a place for leveling of books for kids reading leveled books, but not only leveled books. But it's probably a conversation that we should have as an organization too about Fontes and Pinnell in the sense that there is, it, we can't go to extremes, right? We want to have level books, that's a good idea for reading, but not only that. Well, I mean, I mean in BC, with reading power, right? I mean, I know lots of teacher librarians have some sections of their collections leveled by read in reading pow power areas, right? Adrian Gear's work, it's really popular in BC. And it's another way to think about connecting and, and you know, and so they have like little you know, a shelf or two of leveled books that are really good for teaching connecting or really good for teaching inference or really good for teaching sequencing or whatever. But nobody would ever say, exactly. we're going to level the whole library based on reading power. But for some reason, we've got to fight the Fontes and Pinnell bandwagon about leveling everything. And the reason they got rid of 5,000 books was because they weren't on the list the Fountas and Pinnell leveled list and some and they wouldn't so they weren't leveled already so they throw them out and they buy books that are already leveled on their her list or their list. Some of that is true some of those books were removed um, and and the removal was somewhat defended by the district in terms of some things were old some things had newer versions some things needed to be updated so I would have to be honest and state that the entire Box, the entire collection that was removed wasn't all simply due to leveling, but the goal was, of course, the leveling so that, uh, so that things were easily accessible and meeting curriculum guidelines. Uh, at the time, and, and I'm glad you say that, uh, at the time the teachers weren't necessarily appalled initially because the concept of leveling books and guided reading is, is a concept teachers are used to. And there's a place for it. And it has a, a valued place and a good place. But it was when one idea was going to be the universal sole only way of doing business that people became very concerned about the infringement of their rights and their professional autonomy and their, their ability to provide students with a liberal choice of interest level books. And, and their own individual decision to choose. I think, I think where teachers became uncomfortable in this whole perception of, of the level books is when they were told that the kids could only read based on the testing that they had done, books at a certain level, which basically cut them off from a whole lot of other books that they would have gladly read if they had been able to. 
but at this point in time, you know, it was, it was rather stringent in the sense that these are the books that the kids can read. Lots of books, but only those books. And kids like to read different levels. And so that's the opportunity that the teachers at this school wanted their kids to have. And that's why they, they came to us, because they had a concern that kids could not read for the, for the fun of reading, as opposed to reading for the leveled books that they, that they need to read, also uh, to a certain degree. Well, teachers are resourceful, though. This is a fun story that I'll share with you, is that, you know, teachers are teachers, uh, and they did some fun stuff, as you would expect them to do. Nobody likes to be put in a box, and so if Richard's next door to me in a classroom, and the pri primary group of his kids are in purple, and my kids are in green, then, uh, you know, we traded books because I had some kids who wanted to read some of those books, and he had some kids who wanted to read some of the books I had. And then I go over there to another teacher and say, you've got the pink books, and I know there's some great books in there at a reading level that will help a child in my room and who might be interested in that. And so even though the entire school had been given little colored dots of who fit where within each classroom, and so myself as a little pink person or a red person today would go to the red dot box, then, um, you know, People themselves want to move outside of that, and teachers let them. Teachers are wonderful at finding ways to facilitate that, those sorts of things that are important to them. And so there's a little black market in books, and uh, they got around, and teachers got around, which is uh, what teachers do and what teacher librarians do when faced with some sort of imposition of a rule. They find a way to do what's right for kids, and they did that in that school as well. Thank you for all the wonderful questions so far. I think we have room for one more, and I see Dr. Shiri is interested in posing one, so I'll give him time to do that, time for you to answer, and then I'll just provide a few closing wrap-up remarks so that we are done uh, on one, so Eb can continue to be where he needs to be this afternoon as well as everyone else in the room. Ali. Okay, thank you very much for an informative presentation. My question is mainly a, a terminological question, if you like, and that is related to the notion of leveling. Now, throughout all these grievances and legal action, like, did you have to explain the notion of leveling or refer to it and its multiple connotations? Because it's very clear that it does have positive, neutral, and negative connotations related to weeding, you know, censorship, or removal of material. So did you have to explain that or establish that as well, a definition? When it, when it came to, to um, explaining the grievance to the board, yes, we, we had the documentation from the Teacher Librarianship Association of BC, and we did pass that along. It was a well-written document. It's fairly new because it happened uh, based on something that was in our district previous to that. So it was a, a document that was new. I think the board understood leveling. to a certain degree what leveling was about, but not the whole concept of what was happening in this particular situation and how it was taken to another level that the teachers weren't comfortable with. I think that the board needed to understand. Uh, Fontes and Pinnell is used all the way through the district. Uh, leveling, there are leveled books in pretty much all the elementary schools. The issue is, is how it was being interpreted in one particular school and how the collection was being managed as you know more leveled than than it should need to be and the un and then the fact that the teachers were uncomfortable with the fact that they had to it was kind of told to them that it would be a good idea to have as many level books as possible and the removal of some of the books from the library again made them feel uncomfortable because there are some books in there that they really liked right it's just like the parent in the first one who said that uh, shopaholic was a bad book to read it's an amoral book well that's a decision made by a parent who came into the book, right? Uh, that particular parent in that first time came in and said, I want all books related to teenagers that have lust in it removed. Well, in high school, whew. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that would be a whole collection. So that, that's the, the concept is that it's okay to have a concept of that. The BC Teacher Librarians Association wrote a really good document that explains it to the level that it should be in a regular school. And I think as long as everybody follows that process, I think everybody's happy. In this particular case, why we were brought in is because it went a little too far. Quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, it, it went quite a bit too far. And it is the extremes, as Richard has mentioned earlier, that leads to the difficulty. Most things in moderation work, but it's when one ideology is the only ideology that things become a problem. 
I have just a couple of minutes to provide closure. Of course, I want to thank Gail and Richard for an extremely informative, urgent, highly relevant, relevant in the moment um, expertise, educational, informative uh, window on the realities of work and life and education, which transcend the School of Library and Information Studies or any particular department of the Faculty of Education or the University of Alberta. This is of interest to kids and parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and community stakeholders. So in the end, although the original idea, once I knew that uh, Gail and Richard were in town would, was that they were going to guest in LIS 531 Collection Management, which I'm currently teaching, and we have four wonderful students attending from that class today. It didn't work out because they uh, yesterday we had a field trip and couldn't accommodate them when they were in town, so the idea went to a noon hour talk, which turned out to be better mm -hmm. because it prompted us to think about recording. And as I said at the outset, I, I think this will be viewed well beyond the people in this room as colleagues, faculty, students, um, and speakers, and um, support from digital, ex-digital, currently new name. <laughs> um, I would encourage everybody in the room to pass it forward, let people know that the recording is coming out. It speaks to Dr. Branch's suggestion that we use and Dr. Oberg's suggestion that when we have positive stories, we carry them forward. I failed to mention my name at the outset. My name is Tony Samick. I'm a faculty member at the school. If you have anybody viewing this in the future, specific questions around these cases, please direct them directly to Gail Costello Chaddock or Richard Chad Bo Chad Costello or Richard Beaudry. If you have suggestions for the School of Library and Information Studies or the Faculty of Education or more, more broadly the University of Alberta, you can certainly contact me, Tony Samick, at SLIS, and I can pass those suggestions to appropriate people to take into consideration your ideas for continuing uh, the learning. And I just want to underscore that each of you that are here today and that will watch in the future, your time and thought is conditional to future and continued success and that these issues um, draw our individual and collective participation into fair and democratic practices in work and labor in Canada and beyond and um, that this deserves all of our attention and so thank each and every one of you especially the speakers and have a lovely afternoon.